In this presentation, we will look in more details of reactive intermediates. And in particular, we will start by looking at radicals. As we mentioned in the last lecture, radicals are one type of reactive intermediates. The others include, of course, carbocations, carboanions, and carbenes. But we will focus for the next few lectures on radicals. So in this presentation, we will cover the following. Detection and characterization of radicals. How do we know they exist? So we'll look at evidence to demonstrate that radicals exist. Next, we'll look at the structure and bonding of radicals. What do they actually look like? Then we look at the stabilities. Of course, we will see that there are different types of radicals and they are all of different stabilities. So we'll look at factors that will determine if a radical is relatively stable or not. Then we will look at the generation of radicals. How are radicals made in the lab? And lastly, we'll start our discussion of radicals in terms of reactions of radicals. We'll start and we'll continue the next lecture with more in more details. So let us begin. So there's early evidence that radicals exist and they came from, or that evidence came from the reaction of triphenylmethyl chloride with zinc, as shown here. So here's trimethyl, triphenylmethyl chloride because, as you know, zinc is a transition element and it's typically a one electron reducing agent. So it was assumed that since this is a white solid here and in the presence of zinc, it turned into a highly colored product, a reaction took place. It was assumed that this was the actual product, a triphenylmethyl radical, and of course the inorganic product here. It was assumed that the radicals formed here, if they were really radicals, they could react with iodine, and they did in fact react to give a color change. Of course, as you know, iodine is a very large halogen, and if it broke apart, it gives iodine radicals, or iodine atoms. And um, this iodine atom will react with a radical, or iodine radical will react with a triphenylmethyl radical to produce this compound here and that was shown to be the product. So one assumption here is that this exists, a triphenylmethyl radical. Let's look further. Proton NMR spectroscopy was used and it was determined that this triphenylmethyl radical actually exists in equilibrium, as shown here with this molecule. So it was not entirely the triphenylmethyl radical, but an equilibrium that exists here. And to prove that this e equilibrium exists, if this molecule here reacts with a strong base, this was the product that was formed and actually isolated. Of course, as you can imagine here, it abstracts this hydrogen here to make this aromatic. And of course, 
um, this is the final product here. Bottom line is that there is strong evidence that a radical exists and in this specific example it is the triphenylmethyl radical. Here are some other radicals that have since been identified. Um, some are very stable and can be identified and actually isolated, such, such as this one, such as these. Others are short-lived but can be identified by different experimental methods. Notice I mentioned here stable. We'll define stable radicals before this lecture is out in terms of what criteria are used to define stability of radicals. But here's a radical and here's another radical and these are two stable radicals. Here are some other types of radicals as you can imagine. This is a methyl radical, a carbon, three hydrogens. It's called a methyl radical. This one is an allylic radical because this is the allylic carbon because it is adjacent to a carbon-carbon double bond. So this is the allylic carbon here and if we have a radical here that becomes an allylic radical. This one is a benzylic radical because here is the phenyl ring of the benzene the next carbon that's bonded to the benzene ring is called the benzylic carbon, which means that this is a benzylic radical. Note the difference. This is a phenyl radical because this carbon here is where the odd electron is. So these are examples of different types of radicals. Let us look at some experimental evidences that have been put forward to demonstrate the existence of radicals. The one that you will see in the book is magnetic susceptibility experiments. The bottom line here is that radicals such as triphenylmethyl radical can be detected by these experiments. Bottom line is, if a species has an unpaired electron, notice an unpaired electron, such as a radical, the species is paramagnetic and attracted to, a, and can be attracted to a magnet. And if we expose that species to an external magnetic field and make a comparison to the same species, which is not exposed to a magnetic field, there's a difference. So as a result, such, ex such experiments can be used to detect the presence of radicals. So that's the magnetic susceptibility experiments. Another type experiment that's more relevant to organic chemists is the electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy, also known as EPR spectro spectroscopy. The bottom line here is that since an odd electron has a spin quantum number of a half or minus a half, for such species that have odd electron, with a spin quantum number, there is a magnetic moment or net magnetic moment. Notice again, it's a net magnetic moment because of the spin quantum number for an odd electron. Thus, in the presence of an external magnetic field, an appropriate frequency the species that has an odd electron can be detected based on these experiments. So again, it's just based on the magnetic moment of a species that has an odd electron. 
if that exposed to an external magnetic field, an appropriate frequency, these species with odd electrons can be detected. Let us look now at the structure and bonding of radicals. So based on gas phase, ultraviolet flash phot photolysis and IR spectroscopy experiments, we can get a good idea of the structure of radicals. There's also reliable evidence from molecular modeling calculations that the radicals exist and what are the structure. Shown here is the methyl radical. As we can see here, a carbon bonded to three hydrogens. It's shown that it is planar. Bond angles here are 120 degrees. It is flat or planar, which means that the orbitals that are used to bond from carbon to these hydrogens here are sp2. So notice three sp2 hybrid orbitals are used to bond to the hydrogens of the methyl radical. There is an unhybridized p orbital which has one electron, the lone pair electron, and that's illustrated here. So that's the odd electron for the methyl radical. It's flat, planar, another description, and the bond angles are 120 degrees and the orbitals that are used to bond from carbon to these hydrogens are sp2 hybrid orbitals. I should point out, however, that if the substitution on the methyl carbons, carbon of the methyl radical is, for example, fluorine, very, which is very electronegative, or other very electronegative atoms, or large bulky groups, the planarity changes. The planar geometry changes to a more pyramidal, changes to a more pyramidal geometry, which would imply that it changes to a more sp3. So we can see here that we have sp3, sp3, and sp3 here to make those bond, and the other electron here is in an sp3 orbital, which would make it more pyramidal, which would look more like ammonia. So this changes primarily based on substitution of the hydrogens of the methyl radical with a very electronegative atom such as fluorine. It was also observed that if the R groups, if R groups are substituted for hydrogens, and especially if they're very bulky, they tend to acquire a more pyramidal type geometry, which makes it more look like this. So, another evidence of that is that the adamantyl radical, because as you know, this is a bridgehead here, and the geometry here is not flat. It's not flat because of the strained bridge. But the radical can exist, and it's fairly stable. Same for the norbornyl radical. At the bridge, in this case, a radical can exist. And of course, as you know, in this case, it is not flat at this point. So therefore, it indicates that this is more pyramidal. One explanation for this is that electronegative atoms such as fluorine, they have a greater degree of P character due to the electronegativity of the atoms. So in other words here, um, for radicals, instead of using sp2, it needs more 
SP character, so it's more SP3 based on the electronegativity. For alkyl groups, it is mentioned that there is increased staggered arrangement of the bonds around the carbon and increased hyperconjugation. So therefore, that would explain why it's less planar, less sp2, and more sp3 or pyramidal. Bottom line is that most radicals that we will encounter in organic chemistry will be sp2, but if there are electronegative atoms bonded to it, or extremely large groups surrounding the carbon of the radical, it tends to be more pyramidal. Let's look at the relative stability of radicals. So here is the methyl radical again, carbon bonded to three hydrogens. Here is the p orbital with the one electron. Let's see what factors can stabilize radicals. Here is, just substitute one of these hydrogens for a carbon with a methyl group. So notice that it's possible for these electrons here in the sigma bond to be adjacent to the p orbital. Since they're electrons and there is a p orbital with one electron, it provides stability to this p orbital with one electron because, of course, as you know, a p orbital can accommodate two electrons, or orbitals in general can accommodate two electrons. So it provides stability to the radical. Thus, here, a, this radical here is more stable than the methyl radical. You can see here this is a primary radical because it's a carbon that's bonded to another carbon. So that's a primary radical. So a primary radical is more stable than a methyl radical. We can take this discussion further. So let's substitute here another carbon and another carbon which has a sigma bond and a sigma bond which can be right across or adjacent to the p orbital which would provide more stability. As you can see here this is a secondary radical. It's a secondary radical because this carbon here is bonded to one and two other carbons. Here's a tertiary radical. So here's this radical, carbon radical, bonded to one, two, and three. And we have the possibility of groups adjacent to the p orbital supplying electrons or providing stability to the radical. As you can imagine, or as you can see, this is a tertiary radical. So therefore, a tertiary radical is more stable than a secondary and more stable than a primary and, of course, much more stable than a methyl radical. Here's another way of representing that, and it's called hyperconjugation. As you can see here, this term hyperconjugation. So what happens here is that the sigma electrons from the adjacent bond. One electron can come in to form a bond here. The other electron com can come in to form a this double bond here. And the other electron can go onto this radical. So this essentially shows the stabilization of the P, this radical, one electron, by the sigma electrons here. So that's just kind of hyperconjugation or resonance using sigma um, electrons to demonstrate the stability brought about by the adjacent bonds. Here is another example. So we can do a secondary here. This of course would be a primary because of this carbon. This is a radical carbon which has two groups so that's a secondary. So we can have here this type of 
stabilization from the adjacent sigma bond here's a sigma bond right here so we're just trying to illustrate using arrows where they can be delocalized or delocalizing the sigma bond well here's a sigma bond into the radical here so this is an illustration of hyper conjugation with the adjacent group let me just clarify again so the adjacent bond is here that's the adjacent sigma bond and we can in fact show that we can delocalize electrons into this bond and making this a radical so that's called hyper conjugation here are other types of radicals as we mentioned earlier this is the allylic radical as we said earlier here it is the carbon with a radical adjacent to a carbon carbon double bond that's the allylic radical these electrons here can be used to stabilize the radical as you can see here this is just another illustration here's a carbon carbon double bond here's the radical but as you can see there is a smooth flow of electrons these three electrons across the p orbital that provides stability because of delocalization of this odd electron here so one way of representing that is by using resonance so we can use we can put these electrons here these well this electron here one of these electron here to form this double bond and the other electron back over here so that's showing the delocalization of this electron on this carbon over to this carbon here that's delocalization or resonance of the allylic radical here's the benzylic so this is the benzylic carbon which has a radical as you can imagine here p orbitals on all of these carbons because they are sp2 hybridized so therefore we can show that there is delocalization of this radical onto the carbons of the benzene ring so we say that the radical is resonance stabilized so the benzylic radical here is resonance stabilized so again you can see that the radical for the allylic and the radical for the benzylic they have additional stability by resonance from the adjacent p orbitals so conclusion so the stability trend for radicals is shown here most stable radical would be the allylic and benzylic then we have the tertiary secondary and methyl of course the primary here is the least stable and of course we know why because there's there are no adjacent sigma bonds to help stabilize that and there are no adjacent p orbitals as in a double bond to help stabilize that radical we'll see the importance of stability of radicals later on when we start doing reactions of radicals let us look at the generation of radicals how are they actually made let's look here at bond energies so we can break a CH bond in a homolytic fashion notice a homolytic which means breaking the bond so that one electron goes to carbon and the other electron of that two electron sigma bond goes to hydrogen so let's look at the methyl bond right here so if we should break this bond homolytically it requires 105 
kilocalories per mole. The radical that's generated is the methyl radical and of course H dot. Notice the methyl radical. Let's go down here to the tertiary carbon. Here's a tertiary carbon. So therefore this bond here, if broken, will give a tertiary radical and of course H plus. And notice it requires less energy to break that bond. So the bond dissociation energy gives an idea of the relative stability of the radical that's formed if there is a homolytic cleavage. So let's summarize that concept. So here is 90 kilocalories per mole. Breaking up this bond here generates the benzylic radical. Very stable, which means that this bond is much weaker than this bond here, which generates the most, the less stable methyl radical. And of course, as we have seen here, it requires more energy. Another way of looking at this is shown here. So here is the homolytic cleavage. Notice the arrows. It's a single barbed arrow of this sigma bond here, which has two electrons. So now we're putting one electron onto hydrogen. Here it is and one electron onto carbon, here it is, to form the allylic radical. Stable. We know this very stable based on the theory that we presented earlier. Here is the tertiary radical. Same type process, a homolytic cleavage, where one electron goes to the hydrogen to form the radical, and the other electron off the sigma bond here goes onto the carbon to form the secondary radical. Notice the energy requirement here is 95 kcals per mole. More energy than that requires to break this bond to give the allylic radical, which is more stable. So another way of looking at this is shown here using the energy profile diagram. So we start out here with the hydrocarbon doing analytic breakage, which is the reaction coordinate in this di direction, or the reaction progress. So what we generate here is a secondary radical, more energy required, and this is the uh, benzylic radical here, which requires less energy. So once again, so we're going from hydrocarbon to a benzylic, less energy, more stable, lower on the energy profile diagram. Remember, anything that's low on the energy profile diagram is stable rel relative to anything that's higher on the energy profile diagram. So again, going from the hydrocarbon to the benzylic radical requires 89 kilocalories per mole and going from a hydrocarbon to a secondary radical requires 95 kilocalories per mole and notice this is less stable because it is higher in energy or higher on the reaction profile diagram compared to the benzylic radical. Let us now look at the cleavage of halogens. So here's the homolytic cleavage of halogens. Notice again, homolytic cleavage. So as you can see here, let's look at chlorine. That's a practical one to start with. So if we should break this bond, notice chlorine here has a sigma bond between the two atoms. Sigma bond with two electrons. Chlorine and chlorine here are the same, so it has equal electronegativities. So therefore, if enough energy were supplied to break this bond right here, we would get chlorine radicals, two chlorine radicals as shown here. 
where one electron goes to one chlorine to form the chlorine atom or radical and the other one would form another chlorine atom or radical. It requires 58 kilocalories per mole to break this bond homolytically. Let's look at bromine. It requires less energy, 46 kilocalories per mole. This would imply that the bromine radical here, let's put it here, we get two because it's a homolytic cleavage of this sigma bond here. So that this would imply, based on the numbers here, or the bond dissociation energies here, that the bromine radical is more stable than the chlorine radical. And we'll see the importance of that when we start doing reactions. So the bromine radical is more stable than the chlorine radical. The chlorine radical, as we'll see, is more reactive than the bromine radical. Extending that thinking, breaking the F bond requires less energy, which would imply that it's more reactive. And it's very reactive, as you can imagine. The fluorine radical is very reactive breaking the iodide, iodine bond requires 36 kcals here as you can less energy again and what happens here is that the iodide radical is very stable due to polarizability due to its size because it's so large it can accommodate that dot or that radical so it's very stable and we'll see later on that it's fairly non-reactive at, at least compared to these here. So when we start doing reactions, our reactions will concentrate primarily on chlorine and bromine and not on fluorine, even though it requires less energy to break it. But because of its electronegativity, it's very, very reactive. Okay, let's look now at some other radicals. As you can imagine in the organic lab, whenever we need radicals, we can generate them from bond homolytic bond breakage of different molecules. The one that we just discussed is of course the chlorine. Very common and fairly cheap. You break this bond here, homolytically you get two chlorine radicals. Here's our benzoyl peroxide. Notice again that here's the peroxide right here. Oxygen, oxygen, same atom, same electronegativity. So breakage of this bond here is a homolytic cleavage in the presence of energy such as heat. And just a slight increase in temperature will break this bond homolytically to give this radical. Notice that this radical here is stable, relatively stable, because of resonance. As we've seen here, we can take the odd electron here and move it to this oxygen as shown here from using resonance. So this is a fairly stable radical and the homolytic cleavage of this benzoyl peroxide in the presence of heat gives this. So as you can imagine, it's used a lot in organic chemistry whenever we need a radical initiator or radical to start a reaction. Here's another molecule, AIBN, which we have seen from our undergraduate course. The driving force here is that the breakage, the hom homolytic breakage of this bond here gives a radical right here and a radical here and same over here as you can imagine there's a bond here so that gives nitrogen as a gas as you know whenever a reaction gives a gas as a product it favors the formation of the product due to entropy this radical here is fairly stable because it's bonded to two, two methyl group 
and also to the CN group. You may recall that the CN group is a carbon-carbon triple bond. So this radical here can be delocalized onto the nitrogen stable radical. So AIBN is used quite a bit in terms of generating radicals if needed. Called radical initiator. So let us just start our reactions. We'll get into more details when we look at the next lecture. But for the chlorination of methane, chlorination of methane, as you can imagine, we have chlorine as a reactant. In the presence of heat or light, it's going to break that bond here homolytically to give chlorine radicals. This step is called the initiation step. Why initiation step? Because it is the initiation of radicals. The radical, the intermediate radical. Radicals are fairly reactive. They're not the product. They will react with other molecules. And as you can see, here is a reaction here where it takes one electron from the sigma bond here of methane, one electron, to form HCl and the other electron goes on to the carbon to form the methyl radical. That's called the propagation step. Why? Because there's more radical that's generated in the mechanism. Propagation of radicals. Ra radicals here <coughs> excuse me. Radicals here can react with more chlorine or it can couple with another radical from the methyl to give the final product and that this final step here is described as the termination step why termination because it gives a neutral product here <coughs> So the steps that we will typically encounter for a free radical reaction or radical or reaction in which a free radical is the intermediate is initiation step, the propagation step. Here's another propagation step. Why? Because a radical generates more radical. And of course a termination step where we finally get the product. And I think this is the Oh yeah, we have one more concept here. So since most radicals are sp2, which means they're flat, in the termination step, so here's a radical, and here is a bromine radical, it could be a chlorine for example. Because it's flat, it can react from either side, so the probability of reacting from either side is 50-50. So therefore, as you can imagine here, we will get a racemic product, of course, if these groups here are dif different. You may recall a racemic product is a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers. 50-50 mixture of enantiomers. So here we have uh, chiral carbon, as we have seen from the previous few lectures and another chiral carbon. One could be R, and then the other one would be S. Here's a specific e example here. So here is butane, reacting it with bromine in the presence of heat, where we abstract one of these hydrogens here. Or the substitution gives us this brominated product, and this brominated product but because the free radical intermediate is flat sp2 it generates 50 50 mixture of the r and the s enantiomer here's another example here where we have a hydrogen here and we get here a mixture of the enantiomers as the product i think this is the last slide yes it is so, we've just started our discussion 
of the reactions of aldehydes. In the next lecture, we will continue our discussion of reactions of radicals. Did I say aldehydes? The reactions of radicals and um, we'll look at different type reactions and we'll continue our discussions. So continue to study hard, continue reading the material in the book and I will have the next lecture posted shortly.